So goodbye. Hello. How's that? It's good. Are we in the backstage or are we, are we live? I think we're live. And, um, if anybody else is seeing this, if you could say something in the uh, chat, that'd be great. I <laughs> <laughs> will wait for a few minutes. I'll, I'm going to switch up the camera and the mic, and I'll wait for uh, wait for the, the, someone to come and introduce. I hope. All right. Hello, Mike. You there? I am. Cool. I think it's time for us to start. Um, I'm not sure whether anyone else there to introduce us since it's an workshop. It's, let's just start by the time. I think it's time by now to start that. Yeah, shall we? Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, you don't think anybody else is coming in like the last week? Not sure. Probably we'll give a uh, we'll give a, give them a minute, maybe. Yeah, I think we should start. Let's start, man. It's time. It's, they said it's fine. Welcome, welcome you all. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us today. The topic of the today's workshop is about uh, how to protect API workloads against OWASP uh, API top 10. 
Uh, I'm Rajesh Bhavanandan, uh, EdgeX uh, Technical Solution Architect. I'm based in Melbourne. I'll let Mike to introduce himself. Yep, and I'm Mike Holland, uh, also an uh, Nginx Technical Solution Architect uh, based in Sydney. Uh, all right, so next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Well, the agenda today, uh, we're gonna we're gonna look into a few aspects. <clears throat> we're gonna actually look into some uh, an unsecured API workload, which is hosted in GCP. Uh, we're actually gonna run the whole demo uh, in GCP today, and uh, we'll also show you how to add authorization, like a chart based authorization. We're gonna use Okta as our IDP. We'll be minting tokens from there to test our API workloads. And also on top of that, we will also try to add uh, our back uh, security to our API gateway, which is Nginx Plus. And uh, we will also have a, like a DDoS protection using our rate limiting mechanism, uh, which is a quite interesting one. That's the one which is you know helping a lot of uh, customers to uh, accurately apply the rate limit at the edge so that they can protect their upstream APIs. The other bit, uh, the important aspect of today's presentation is uh, about how to apply WAF policies uh, inside uh, Nginx Plus using you know, the CI/CD pipeline. The whole uh, presentation is going to be uh, you know, using the CI/CD pipeline. In, in a minute, uh, I'll let Mike to uh, explain that out. So uh, some of the uh, WAF policies uh, which address the OWASP top 10 is uh, how to you know, high accuracy signature and the custom block responses and the HTTP protocol validation. These are all the things which we are going to see as part of the demo. Moving on to the next. Yeah, so next uh, we'll just talk about a bit of uh, how the lab is set up. So as uh, as we just mentioned, it is hosted today in, in Google Cloud, uh, but it could just as easily be hosted at any other public cloud or private cloud. So I just want to say we're not, uh, not pushing any particular public cloud, but it will work in any of them. So what we have is just uh, a basic uh, terminal setup uh, on, on my machine, which is going to interact with uh, Nginx Plus instance, uh, which has been pre-configured with uh, a lot of standard configurations that you'd find on uh, fronting any enterprise uh, API service today. And then on top of that, uh, as we just mentioned, we have a, a CI CD pipeline where we'll make our changes in GitHub. GitHub will uh, send a webhook to Jenkins. And Jenkins will in turn make the changes to Nginx Plus using an, an Ansible playbook. Uh, and then once we test our, um, our uh, violations and, and different uh, scenarios, we'll see that the logs are output into an Elk stack uh, that we're also hosting in um, GCP. And, uh, and we'll be able to see uh, the results of, of those transactions. So, um, yeah, so Thanks just like uh, as we move forward, um, I guess we just want to, uh, Rajesh, would you like to start our CR demo? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's all we are waiting here for. So uh, we'll do that. So as, as you all know, uh, Nginx uh, is a completely uh, cloud agnostic uh, one. So it doesn't really matter where you run. You can run on-prem, you can run AWS, you can run GCP. Today we chose uh, GCP because we automated uh, the whole thing end to end. So I thought, okay, we just show it in one of the cloud. Pretty much we tossed a coin, chose uh, GCP and just we are going with it. Uh, probably with this, uh, three of us, including the presentation, probably uh, people may not be able to see the screen, uh, you know, in a bridge. We'll try not to be on the screen uh, uh, now and then, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how that works. So the first one, what uh, we wanted to start with is, um, we have an API, we have an API, we have a microservices that has been deployed uh, in the GCP. It's a, it's a, it's a F1 uh, API, uh, it's, there's no security, I believe. Uh, so that's what Mike is gonna talk about. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let him to drive that bit. Yeah, so just to start the, the demo, this is the terminal I mentioned in the, uh, the lab setup. And what we have is just uh, behind it is it's just a Formula One uh, standard microservices API. And what we're going to send first is a, is a curl command just to show a successful uh, response. So with this response here for the driver's JSON, you can see that. Um, uh, and please let us know in the chat if this is not viewable or if there's anything we can do. I know uh, we're going to try and disable the cameras to see if, if that helps. But it looks like it still leaves our, our score. Though. Um, but uh, so yeah, so we can see here in the screen uh, in the terminal 
uh, that we have a successful response. So a list of all of our formula drivers. So with this being an example of a successful response, um, what, uh, how, how, you know, Rajesh, how, how can we look to secure this a bit better with the agenda items you mentioned? Absolutely. So uh, the first thing uh, what we could do is uh, we can protect this uh, against um, a, a token, which you can be, you know, coming from any IDP. In this particular case, we have chosen to go with uh, Okta, any IDP which has an Open ID Connect, uh, uh, you know, enablement on that one. If it has the Open ID Connect configuration endpoint with it, all we need is a few information from there. One is the JWK's key endpoint, and the other one is the issuer. With these two information, we should be able to, you know, quite easily uh, get in and uh, do that bit. So Mike would uh, start to actually show a bit. If you get into the, I don't know, the place uh, GitHub where we can actually show them a little, maybe I will actually uh, go uh, shut down my camera so that that would look a little bigger. Yeah, it, Mike, yeah. If, if to let us know if if it's helpful to turn the cameras off or on, if we can see the screen bigger, uh, we're getting a yeah. bit of different feedback here on this side. But uh, just further along the demo, uh, so so Jot would be fantastic to add a, a bit of security to the to the front. Uh, and so Rajesh, let me let me show you how we can implement that using our our CD CI. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, That's the one okay. thing which I wanted to highlight to you, Mike. I am um, uh, all this. I wanted the to be deployed as part of CI/CD pipeline. I don't want to go and dwell with you know all my Nginx plus configuration. All I want to do is uh, change something in my GitHub. So uh, whenever my developers go and check in some changes to it, I want that to be you know automatically deployed to the uh, instances, the Nginx plus instances. So you know I, we can go faster. We can actually deploy our changes into uh, any environment. Uh, in any given environment, so yeah. show us. Definitely. All right. So, so what we have here is just uh, my GitHub repo. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, a public repo. So, if you're interested in following along, or I'm moving a bit quick, or maybe the font's a bit small, uh, feel free to to go in and, and follow along from there. But as switch, I mentioned, switch off switch off your video. That would help them to see, you know, a little oh, okay. bigger if it's okay. All right. There we go. All right, so so we'll start here with adding our, our Jot configuration. So what I have is is the files here that'll be changed from our um, uh, CI CD pipeline. We'll start with Nginx, and we're gonna go in and um, and uh, Rajesh is gonna tell yeah. everybody what we're doing while I'm doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So this nginx.conf, this particular project, what he's actually showing, uh, Mike is showing you, you should be able to easily get that out. Uh, you can see that in the GitHub. So what uh, he's trying to do right now is to uh, go and enable uh, the job verification uh, within the nginx directive. So all he's trying to do is, we already did this one. All we're doing is uh, you know, uncommented. The place where he just did it, he, that's the place where we configure our JWKS URI. So currently it is configured to have Okta. Opta as an IDP, uh, I have my own Opta uh, instance running, so I'm using that uh, as an identity provider today to just move move forward. So the checks what we are doing here is uh, we're checking, making sure that IDP is uh, is the right issuer uh, is being issued from the token is issued from, and what's the right audience for it. So once if we if we check in this, Mike, I hope this actually deploys. Uh, you know, <laughs> I hope it's, this deploys into our uh, GCP and so that we don't have to jump into one. So this is what normally anyone would, uh, you know, try to do that in their CI/CD pipeline. And Nginx being such a friendly CI/CD uh, tool, I really wanted this to make sure that it's getting deployed, and we can see something happening in Jenkins as well. So is, yeah. Is that coming? yeah. Yeah, so with the, with the changes being made, once I hit the, the commit changes here, a webhook is being sent to to our Jenkins pipeline. And what we should be able to see here is number 68 has kicked off uh, automatically. And if we just dig in a little deeper um, into the- uh, Don't delete the, the project. <laughs> as it's being made, we can see here in the console output the Ansible playbook uh, that's running. So it's going through, it's pulling the latest changes from our GitHub repo. And then it's using Ansible to check to see the directories exist and then push uh, WAF policies and new Nginx config directly to our Nginx Plus instance. So once that has completed, and it looks like it has successfully completed, we'll uh, go back to our instance, yeah. and then uh, we can see here that, um, sorry, I got a request to uh, increase the font size, so hopefully that's a bit better. Um, we can see that if I run the same request again, 
<clears throat> we get uh, 403 forbidden. That's right, Mike, because uh, as we just said, uh, we have enabled that particular directive within Nginx uh, to go and verify whether you're supplying that token or not. By default, Nginx expects you to send that token as a barrel token. So until unless you get a token, uh, a valid token from the configured issuer, you won't be able to move forward. So why don't you actually issue a, a request to Okta and uh, try to get a token. Notice one thing there, you don't, you have not mentioned any scope. Keep that in mind. Issue issue this request. You should be you should be getting a token. All right, cool. So we have, we got our token back, and then we go back to our original request, and then we just add uh, a header in here for. Uh, with our our new token. New token. SS. That's right. This is a better token. And once we send this request, we can see now that we don't get the 403, but we get the same successful request we saw in the beginning. How's that, Mike? That is amazing. So that, we added a bit of security, our first step on securing our API. All right. Cool. So what, uh, what should we do next? Mike. So this is not good enough, right? I mean, we, we, talk, we talked about protecting the API. This is good, but there are APIs which may require uh, elevated access. I want, uh, I, I want this for, for, let's take this as an example. I don't want uh, anyone else uh, to go and uh, uh, you know, use this API until unless this particular role is admin. If his uh, you know or back is not an, uh, he's not as an uh, as a admin role, I don't want him to access this API at all. So. The way to do that one is inside that API, if you can see that inside the location API, what Mike is trying to do is uh, there is a check which is happening as uh, whether the particular role uh, is admin. So as part of the Nginx configuration, what Nginx does is Nginx goes and actually verifies the token. It verifies uh, the claims like audience. It verifies the claims like uh, issued at and then expiry. On top of that, also bring uh, the claims, uh, the custom claims, which we have defined where we have configured to read them from. So currently what it has done is it read the claim and it made sure that it is, it's been part of the, um, uh, you know, the API gateway. So next time, if you issue the uh, request, it shouldn't work. Is that deployed? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. It so if work. You, yeah, right. it shouldn't work. <laughs> if you try to hit that one, because uh, you are not an admin user, uh, because you uh, there you go. So you don't have uh, um, uh, you know appropriate access uh, rights to access this API. The only way you can get access to it that is uh, if you again you have to issue the uh, request to Okta, but this time you have to uh, issue the request along with the scope of token. Only if your user is uh, configured to have that admin role uh, along with the scope uh, mapped to it, then you will get that uh, token with admin token. Let's see what 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 comes back. Cool. So I got a new token here. That's right. Let's go back and we'll add our um, our header again. Check my spelling. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we'll just grab that new token, mm -hmm. and we'll try and do another submit. That should work. And you can see now we got a successful response. So fantastic. So now we've got some R back involved. We got JSON web tokens. But the very simple changes. Very simple changes. You can configure it and um, you yeah. should be able to you know, do this quite in a, in a quite a quite a easy way uh, within your Nginx Plus to protect your APIs. So is that good enough, Mike? to a start with. Well, no, I was thinking, I mean, how do we prevent from people abusing this, right? I mean, once they get a login, how do we how do we control the number of requests they can make yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, prevent uh, potential DDoS attacks? Yeah, that's a good one. Because um, at, um, the DDoS attack is one of the biggest problem because uh, we, we still run a lot of legacy applications or, you know, in the old infrastructure where we can't actually, you know, stress 
our application on the on the back end. So it's better to protect that in the edge level and uh, API gateway is the right place where you can you know stop those kind of attack being happened. So within this same config, what you have what you could do is uh, the place where you just enabled uh, the uh, authorization. Uh, point where you can actually go and enable that limit request uh, where you can actually start to uh, you know throw 429 so previously what we have done is we have enabled uh, the rate limiting to rate limit to be 3 per minute but just for the testing purpose we have done that you can do that per second or per minute and uh, you know for hundreds or thousands it's totally up to you just for our workshop uh, purpose what we have done is we just made sure that it is only 3 per minute the way how uh, Nginx works is it actually divides the uh, number of requests per minute. For example, let us say, let us say there are ten requests per minute is configured. That means it will only play one request every two hundred second. If you try to actually push more than one request within within that two hundred millisecond, Nginx will throw you an error because it's it's like a hard stop there. That's the way how Nginx is configured to do it. This is this is one of the you know the best feature of uh, Nginx Plus. And also on top of that, sometimes people will say that no, that's not the good way. We want to actually you know have some burst limit as well. We didn't apply the burst, but you can actually apply a directive where you can say that yeah, ten requests per minute is fine, but I'm happy to handle burst of like five requ five extra requests, which means. At within the 200 milliseconds, you can send the extra five requests. The rest of the four requests will be queued, and then it will be played one by one. So that's the way how Nginx actually works uh, through the rate limiting. Now it has been deployed. Let us see what's, what happens with this. OK. There you go. And now you can see we've got the 429 back. We've exceeded our, our rate limit. That's right. The, the, we, we purposefully did that very less so that you can actually see the data. So that particular one, it actually came from that response type, whatever you are seeing there, it can be easily configurable. That's uh, uh, within, within Nginx Plus. So the way how we have configured that to be responded back is that way. So oh, fantastic. So it's uh, it's 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 also too. How how do we uh, determine what value we're looking at to uh, to determine the the rate limit? Sorry, uh, come again. What is that thing? So, so I just was curious. Are we looking at source source IP? Are we looking at? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. That's a very good question. So the way how the rate limit uh, is applied here for this per workshop purpose, uh, we have applied that based on the the user. The JAR token, whatever the information came through, there is a field called subject. Subject is an unique identifier of a user. So we have used that to apply the rate limiting. However, Nginx Plus actually let you to apply the rate limit not just on the user ID. You can do that in an IP address. You can do that on the server level. You can do that on any variable that comes with the JAR token. So it's totally up to you where you wanted to do this. But usually we have seen that I get applied in, in the API level or in the user level. That's good, Mike. That's good. So uh, at least I think uh, we've seen one part of it. Now we are going to see, uh, you know, the important uh, bit of uh, the presentation. I would love to actually see because I mean, from I'm coming from a DevOps world, uh, we uh, the WAF is never being managed by us. It's always managed by someone else. But I have seen teams who would love to actually manage those WAF policies as part of the gateway, so that it's easy for them to control the attacks happening from the internet. So let us take as an example, I would love to see how easy it is uh, to apply the L7 bytes, L7 HTTP uh, attacks. So that, uh, you know, I, I want to do exactly the same way. Uh, like, you know, I use the CICD pipeline. I want that, you know, those policies to be friendly. How do I do that? All right. So, yeah, fantastic. Great question. All right. So what, what we'd like, uh, just to start with real quick, I just want to cover a few of these, these files here in, in our GitHub repo. Uh, just to discuss uh, what they're doing before we, we introduce the Nginx Apertect into our, our API gateway. So we are all familiar with the Nginx.conf file, and, and up until now, those are the, where we've been making our changes to add rate limiting, to add uh, JSON web token protection, role-based uh, access control. But now we're moving into some of the other files listed here uh, to start adding our Layer 7 HTTP uh, uh, per, uh, remediations, uh, preventions, uh, to put those in place in front of our API. So having a look here, so we have two uh, WAF policies, uh, and they are the files ending in .json. So the first one is an Nginx default uh, policy. 
which I just like to show as this is the one that comes with uh, um, our, our WAF uh, as a base policy, uh, which provides a lot of protections, high accuracy signatures uh, for your APIs and your web applications. But for today's demo, we've actually gotten a bit more detail into our, our, our policy. And so with Nginx App Protect, we use a, uh, a declarative JSON uh, interface to, to do our configurations. So it can be easily uh, maintained within a, a GitHub, a Git repo uh, of your choosing. Yes, so, so for this policy, my, policy here, I hope yeah. uh, I hope these policies are not going to be Git copy pasted. I want this to be deployed through Jenkins exactly the same way. All right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll get the, um, yeah, I'll definitely definitely do that. But from these uh, policies here, you can see that we have we start with the base policy that you saw before, but we've got a bit more uh, a bit more to it uh, where we've we've uh, fashioned a, a, a custom response page. We've added a few more block settings, and we've added an additional feature uh, to try and make the policy uh, a bit more robust. So with this new uh, policy, now with these files uh, configured here, sorry, I'll just mention real quick, the last file in here that I didn't talk about was the, uh, the um, uh, Ansible playbook, which if you're interested uh, is available if you want to come see it. And that's what I use in the, the Jenkins uh, CI CD pipeline. But if you go back into our nginx.conf, I can show you where uh, we're, we can implement our, our new WAF. Yeah, that's cool. So um, yeah, so these four lines of configuration here are all you need to uh, to enable your WAF, and I'll just go over those real quickly while we're while we're there and while I'm editing them. Got to remember to hit the edit button. <laughs> um, oh, you had to go up. I went past it. You had to go up. You had to go up. Okay. Why the numbers change? Yeah, all right, cool. Um, so yeah, so these four lines here. So we have the first one here that enables the policy and turns on uh, Nginx App Protect. We have the second one, which defines the policy. So you see the name matches the, uh, the name of the, the policy that we looked at in the previous screen. And then we also enable um, security logging and we uh, point to uh, not only where we want the log sent to, so the ELK stack we mentioned in, earlier in the lab setup, uh, but we also uh, have a file which formats the logs in the way we want to see them. So for this change, we'll just go and turn it on. So Mike, can I actually forward this request to any log collector I wanted to? Not just to ELK, I can, I can push it to anyone, anyone, right? Any log oh, collector, to any blank or sumo logic or any log collector. Yeah. Yeah. You can. Very good question. Very good question. You're right. Um, so yeah, you can send it off to your own seam, your own elk stack, your own Splunk instance. Uh, so it is the the logs are, are formatable. So you can put them in any order you want. Key value pairs. You want to use uh, pipes to separate your your uh, information. So you know it is very configurable and how you send them and then where you send them to. Yeah. Cool. And so. I'll just commit this, uh, and I just want to just highlight real quick that we're putting this at the server server context. I'm about to ask that, uh, Mike. So uh, I, I realized that you uh, you actually added that uh, a logic uh, that particular one uh, you know enabled that at the gateway level. So what if I want to apply that policy uh, in the sorry the API gateway level? If I want if I wanted to apply that in the you know API route level, can I do that? You can. Uh, in fact, you know, within the the Nginx Plus uh, language, uh, it would be a, a location. And so, yes. for these App Protect policies, you can you can apply it at the server level, like you've seen here. But you can also apply it at the location level. So you can have a technology specific policy right. for um, API endpoint. That's exactly where I'm going because uh, these days uh, it's it's pretty much people are writing uh, their. Uh, microservices in different languages. So there will be a need where I have to apply different set of policies to different APIs. So I would prefer to apply those policy in the API if I need to. Definitely, definitely a big plus. So just to show here, so I'll make the same request as before to show that, that it's successful. So well, we still have our, our admin scope in there. So we've authenticated successfully as we've done before. 
if I can update this here to uh, include a, a command injection attack. So just uh, use the same one. So we still need our authentication. I'm going to go grab uh, our attack. So we can see here what's been added is a, a command injection attack, right? So we want to uh, cat a, uh, for the password file, right? That's and so official problem. Yeah. 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 Which is one of the uh, OWASP API top 10 injection attacks. Uh, and so you can see here that we send the request and we don't get the successful response we got back before because Nginx App Protect has recognized the attack and sent us back our, our block response. But what is that support ID, Mike? Yeah, so uh, great question. The support ID here, if we just copy it real quick, we can go over to our Elk stack, which has been collecting all our logs while we've been doing all of our changes and uh, right. successful requests and block requests. And we can just simply search for, for that support ID. And what we'll see come up here is a description of the attack that was encountered. So right. if if you or your customers, you know, believe that it might be a false positive or something's not working properly, you can go in and get a, a wealth of detail on uh, you know, information for the attack here. So we can see for this particular one, uh, it, it found uh, several different problems with the request. Uh, the main one, the command execution, which is what we set up, uh, is is the reason why it was it was blocked. So it highlights what type of attack it's been happening. So. Is, is that right? Is that an attack type? It's actually highlighting there. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, and it uses all that information to formulate a, a, a severity, a violation level, and then determine whether it should be blocked or, or passed based on that information. Does it, does it trigger any other alarms as well uh, as part of this request, or it's, it's pretty much it's the uh, same thing? Is there any alarm I can see? It's more, more here, it actually it did a hard stop. Is there any place where in the log I can see the alarms? Okay, well, so so we can see the attack types uh, in this line here, but also as you go down, you can see, um, you know, the signature set names that were um, triggered. So we can see command execution signatures, signatures that look for uh, specific uh, keywords like, you know, cat and password. Um, but yeah, I, I guess another thing I'll, I'll point oh out too, I'm just about to ask that one. There is something which I read from the one it's called, it's called sub violation and says a protocol compliance filed host header contains IP address. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 good good call out. Um, we're, we were gonna show a bit of that uh, towards the end, but I just, yeah, it definitely, it's a good call out because it leads us to our, our next uh, uh, segue. Um, I, I, but, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone to access my API with IP address, Mike. I would prefer them to send with, you know, using the domain name or the DNS, which I've been passed to, because IP address tend to change. And I really don't want my consumers to use the IP address to call my API. Definitely, definitely. Great segue. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, if we if we st step out of here for a second, I'll clear out that support ID and just make sure we're ready for the next Bit, but we'll come back here. And you remember that that uh, JSON declarative policy I, I showed you for same before. policy, right? Same policy as before. But you're right. You're very right. So we have in here configured uh, HTTP protocol violations so that the requests are following uh, HTTP RFC. Okay. Uh, but you can see that we are alarming on it so that we're being made aware how often we're seeing it but that we have blocking turned off. So you mean so to say that I can actually choose uh, to just alarm? Uh, like a uh, check check that, or I can even block it if I really wanted to uh, through these policies. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's a good way to implement new features without risking uh, a false positive. So right. so we we've seen the alarm now, and and like you said, you you don't think anybody should be requesting their API with an IP address. So yeah. why don't we make a quick change and see if we can prevent that from happening? Mm -hmm. So uh, we we'll just go into our policy again. All um, CI/CD, all GitHub changes here so far, uh, and then we'll just make that change. So we'll make a change to our WAF policy, which is also handy because you can use the same policy for multiple applications with minor minor changes. So one of the things we also support in policies is re references. So we can reference other snippets of policies. 
Uh, so if, like you mentioned before, SecOps wants to add something into all the policies, yeah. they can go make a change in their own GitHub repository and your next push will have their changes included. Yeah, I'm about to ask that because uh, this, this, uh, there are certain set of policies which I would love to uh, let the enterprise security team to apply and some of them you know, get applied by the application developers. So if we have this level of segregation, it's easy for uh, the, you know, the roles to play, to you know, clearly apply those policies in a different, with using different personas. Thank you. Yeah, without any bottlenecks. So yeah, definitely a, a plus. So what we have here for the next test is you can see I'm making my curl request via an IP address. Yes. I've gotten rid of my command uh, injection attack. It's and so this it, was yeah. successful earlier. So we can see if we scroll up a bit that the same request was successful. And then if we run it again, we can see we got a block. And so if we just grab the support ID again to, to validate why, go ahead and put it in there, do an update. And then we'll be able to see here a bit more information on uh, on why. So we can see as we scroll down here, now the attack type is the okay. HTTP parser attack. Yep. And uh, we can see it was rejected. And then we can see uh, the sub violations, uh, HTTP protocol compliance failed, host header contains IP address. So uh, according to HTTP 1.1, uh, host headers should have a FQDN. Yeah. So can, can you actually maximize the screen a little bit? I think people are uh, struggling to see that one. Probably uh, you know, increase the font size as well if you can. Uh, sure, yeah, let's do that. Um, is that a bit better? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> so <sure. laughs> um, all right, so yeah, so again, uh, HTTP parser attack yeah. was the attack type detected. And then as we go down here, we can see, I just highlight here, this is the whole message that was received. So the whole request was recorded. Yeah. Um, and again, this is configurable using that, that file that I, I, I mentioned, you know, and, and I'll show you here in a second, yeah. uh, what, what information is, is sent, what, what policy name, uh, why it was blocked, all that information is there. And if we just go back for a second to, um, oh, you know what, I don't have that file in here. Um, to, yeah, so to, I can demonstrate that towards the end, but um, just to see how that is, uh, yeah, we'll just go back, we'll clear that out. And I just want to show that we can make one modification to our request and show that we can get it compliant. Yes, I want that successful. All right. Now we can see by changing to FDN, uh, now we've got a successful response. So, so yeah, so we were able to uh, validate HTTP RFC, so protocol validation. Um, That's good. good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually wanted to ask about a few things which I noticed. Uh, let's jump on to the video for a minute. Um, one thing which I noticed when you're talking about is uh, the threat campaign. What is, what is this threat campaign? What, what I mean, uh, the DevOps people are not well exposed to this, you know, the the SecOps world of the things. So if you could explain what is what's really the threat uh, the campaign is, we I have a I have a bit of understanding, but I just wanted to validate that. Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, it's a good good to notice that in the policy there. So yeah, um, yeah we have uh, configured uh, threat campaigns, and so. Um, as you may not be aware, just uh, the Nginx App Protect technology is actually based on F5's web application uh, security the technology that they've had for the last decade. So uh, the signatures, the uh, and threat campaigns, all that information, all are coming from from all that experience. And what a threat campaign is 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 by correlating all that experience and information from other uh, F5 WAFs uh, around the world we're able to detect specific uh, threat campaigns as they're occurring, where they're occurring from, what type of violations we're seeing occur, how frequently they're occurring. And with that, we're able to develop more specific signature-like information that we call threat campaigns right. and send that on a more frequent basis. So signatures uh, are updated uh, basically every fortnight um, uh, based on the, the threat levels, but threat campaigns are upgraded much, much more frequently. Uh, because we see them a lot but but since they're so specific like i said source ips specific attacks happening together uh we're able to then look at uh, the events happening as they're happening uh for your protected api for your protected website yeah. and determine whether 
it's a, it's a threat campaign. So, um, so yeah, very powerful tool to have enabled in your web application firewall. So if I put it put it in a DevOps world of the side, uh, you mean to say that uh, if if, uh, if you want to uh, mitigate a problem with a common uh, CVEs which we found in a specific language, I would say, so that can I treat as a threat campaign that somebody is exploiting uh, a specific Java vulnerability, a specific Struts vulnerability, is that part of a threat threat, uh, threat campaign? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you just have the base policy on here, just high accuracy signatures for your steady state, and then you have threat campaigns and you're uh, frequently updating those, if there's a threat campaign that has a specific series of events that are occurring, it, it can block those attacks uh, to, to keep your website safe without having any technology specific uh, signature sets uh, integrated. The other bit which I noticed there is you also highlighted the data guard. Data guard is a uh, you know uh, it's a pretty popular back in the US. I know that they're very very you know uh, fussy about uh, uh, some of the information which should go out and which shouldn't go out kind of things. So can you explain this uh, in in a way like what where is, what is data guard? How would I actually use this? And look like it's configurable. Uh, so how could I actually apply that into Nginx Plus and how how does that help? Yeah, so we, we got an example of a data guard configuration here in our policy. Basically, um, for this configuration here, we're looking for the format of credit cards, so credit card numbers. So what we can do is look for specific uh, sequences of, of data and determine is it in an email address, is it a social security number, is it a credit card, is it a TFN, uh, whatever is deemed confidential by your company or your government. And we can look for the data and we can either block it or in this case here, we're masking the data. So as that information right. comes through the WAF, we can, uh, we can mask it. So um, it's a very powerful feature there to, to protect uh, information as it's going through your, so this is not just requests, like a lot of the other stuff's been looking at requests, but this is also responses. So if there does happen to be a vulnerability in your API that you may have neglected to notice, and somebody's found a way to pull out uh, personal identifiable information, Data Guard can be used to, to watch for that and to look for those specific patterns and then mask it on its way out. That's cool. This, this, the, both of them are going to be really uh, helpful uh, back in time. Uh, I used to run a, uh, you know, teams uh, where they tend to have you know, uh, like a tons of APIs. If there is a vulnerability, what happens is to roll out those changes into production, it would take months and months of time for us to move from, you know, a test to a production environment. We always needed something that we can, you know, stop at the edge where we can quickly, you know, switch it on and switch it off kind of things. With the WAF policies, WAF uh, tools, what I have seen in the past, uh, it never helped that way. It had to go through a certain process. It's always a tedious process. With this approach, it looked like I can actually switch it on and switch it off whenever I wanted to. When my when my applications are ready to handle those things. If my applications are upgraded to the latest version of Java or the latest version of Node.js, which doesn't have that vulnerability, then I can go and switch it off anytime. So th that is fantastic. That one definitely will help. So one thing which I wanted to highlight to the viewers as well, this WAF policy bit is, uh, is a, a separate dynamic module. It is not part of Nginx Plus. You need to install that as a dynamic module to enable this WAF. So you can choose not to do that. If you're running multiple instances or in the, in the different stacks of in your architecture, you can decide to deploy this you know, app protect. That, the, the, product, the, the product name is called uh, uh, Nginx App Protect or NAP. So you could, you could apply that in the edge or you can even apply that closer to your applications if you're running your Nginx Plus closer to your application. So there's multiple ways you do. So it is pretty much you can you can choose not to install it or you can install it based on your requirement within, within Nginx Plus. Yeah, with that dynamic module, you can put it anywhere you can install Nginx Plus. So, um, you know, and something we haven't haven't really chatted about on this was, was containers, right? In Kubernetes environments. So That's we do... Right make a Kubernetes ingress controller, uh, and we can put Nginx App Protect in front of that as well. So very, definitely very powerful with dynamic modules. If I could just take a second though to point out, I, I neglected to show the format of the um, log policy. So this is the- um, Can you, the can you maximize policy. a little bit more if uh, you can? Yes, I can here. Let me, um... yeah, is that better? Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, cool. So again, it's a, it's a JSON, um, JSON blob, and uh, we can go through, we can configure what types of requests we can, uh, fil uh, we can filter on the types of requests to be sent off to your, and in this case, an Elk instance, but maybe in your case, it's a Splunk or another seam. 
And then we can also uh, format the content. So as I mentioned there, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to, uh, you know, log this to client IPs and the violation. If you wanted to maybe shorten down your messages, maybe you're having a storage issue, you don't want to see the entire request. You can go through here and configure exactly what's sent to make sure you're getting what exactly what you need. That's great, Mike. I think this is the first ever time we have ever finished uh, the demo within uh, you know <laughs> within the time itself which has been given to us. That's fantastic. Maybe uh, we'll uh, have a uh, you know nine more minutes. We could ask uh, the viewers if they have any questions. We could help them to you know by answering that. Did you already cover the one here? Is there any consequences of applying rate limiting? How could we use it effectively because we can't have one rate limit? I didn't see that question. Where about? Uh, probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth one from the bottom. Yeah, I can see that uh, thing is from Jazeera. I think Lauren actually responded back. Yeah, you could. Uh, the question is, is there any consequence of applying rate limiting? How about, uh, how should we use it uh, effectively because we can't have one rate limit? No, it's actually, uh, I don't see a consequence. It's a, definitely an add-on, a value add-on uh, to the rate limit because uh, you, no, it's, it also depends on how you're going to size your upstream services as well. For example, when you actually develop your service, uh, it may require a database or it may require to talk to a, a, a backend service and that may have uh, uh, you know some restrictions. It, it can handle only you know, 1,000 requests per second. So you can't send more than 1,000 requests per second uh, to the service. So it's better to stop that in the edge. And Nginx Plus being such a lightweight and it, is, it, it can handle those kind of things quite quickly without even routing the request. So I would, I, 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 we have not seen the, actually our customers love to use Nginx Plus uh, uh, rate limiting much more. Uh, than any other product because of its accuracy and the way how it uh, apply the rate limit, especially when you go to the cluster, when you run multiple API gateways and if you want to synch synchronize that rate limiting between micro, between the Nginx Plus instances, it's quite easy to do it. It's a, a simple sync command where it will make sure that those, uh, the counters are uh, being, uh, you know, uh, synced between multiple API gateway. It's definitely an add-on rather than any consequence. Uh, how it should apply effectively it is definitely it's a subject uh, subject to how you wanted to do it because uh, again how where you want to apply or you uh, i have seen customers uh, predominantly customers use that for uh, users uh, as, I, as i just showed you uh, we applied that based on the subject in the in the client you can choose to apply that in the client id or you can apply to do that in the ip address so you, you can choose uh, completely how you wanted to do it totally based on your own uh, requirement a lot of customers also seen used IP address or the server name as well. But a couple of other questions come. Uh, if the request come in beyond the limit set, what happens to the request? Again, that is the setting. So you can hard stop it. Uh, Hillary has asked this question. You can hard stop it saying that now this is it. You, you have to get up. Or you can accept certain limits saying that, you know what, uh, 100 requests per minute, I can actually take 110 or 120 requests uh, per minute. Then we can actually configure it to queue it, queue the question. Uh, sorry, queue the uh, request in this one, or you can actually you know, completely reject it. So there is a configuration within the rate limit where you can configure to do so. If queue, what is the size of the queue? So good question. <laughs> if it is queued and you can decide uh, how big the queue is, for example, uh, you can define that as part of the Nginx configuration. And uh, you can also define that if it goes beyond that uh, bit and you can actually you know, uh, uh, flush some of the request out of the queue. That is very, uh, you know, pretty much configurable in a way that you can do that. Uh, the other question came from Subic Das. In a cluster environment, does the rate limit counter apply across the entire cluster? Yes, it does. So does each node maintain its own counter? No, it does not. That's the beauty of Nginx. So what it does is it actually has a synchronized. Uh, that's what I was talking about. There is an another, uh, if, if Mike can go to that one, uh, Mike, if you show them the Nginx uh, conf file where we applied the rate limit. Uh, that uh, rate limit it's nginx conf i think it should be on the top in the http block somewhere there you go stop there if 
you can increase the size a little bit more. So that's the place we apply the rate limit. You can see that we are using the uh, as zone. So on that particular place, that's where we are talking about the previous question someone, Hilary was asking like, what is the size of it? So that is the place where the, uh, the values, the zone uh, actually maintains that one. You can choose the size, how much you want it to, totally depends on how big your RAM is. So there I have given us a 10, uh, 10 MB, 10 M. And also mentioned that the three requests per minute. Along with that, if you view uh, another uh, parameter called burst, burst is equal to ten or twenty. However, you wanted to, it actually uh, you know queue those requests and play it. When it actually when you run a cluster of environment, uh, you, there is an another uh, parameter called sync. That sync parameter actually uses the zone as a unique identifier, and it try to replicate that. Uh, to, to all those um, uh, cluster environment. The beauty of that, um, the synchronization is that you can choose how often you should synchronize between uh, the requests. For example, here we say that uh, 10 requests per minute, then you can choose uh, every 100 milliseconds, I would love to uh, synchronize my counters between the cluster. So that level of flexibility Nginx Plus gives you. Uh, yes, the 10 m is the size of the zone, it's 10 MB or something. Yeah, I have a Yeah. Cool. All right. That Any uh, additional does. questions? These are great questions. I did uh, grab while while you were chatting and answering those questions. I did grab uh, one of the custom log files. If anybody yeah. is interested in uh, sure. seeing that, and I've zoomed in. <laughs> I think max size. I'm almost out of screen. Real estate. Um, did you want to answer those rate limiting questions before I jump in? Yeah. The, uh, so, like, uh, how does uh, NCT play uh, the rate limit? Oh, I think uh, what he's talking about is uh, max concurrent transactions. Uh, so, back the the concurrent transaction again, as as I was saying, um, you can actually uh, it, it, it's combination of multiple parameters, as I was saying. So, if you actually send. Uh, here, in this uh, example, what we just showed, we say, uh, for simplicity, let's say 100 requests per minute. And then you are going to send 100 requests per second. That means what will happen is uh, it will uh, it, it will accept the first request. It will reject the rest of the 99 requests. That's it. But if you apply an, another parameter called burst with saying that accept 99, like a burst is equal to 99, what it will tend to do is all those concurrent transactions will be stored in the queue and it will be slowly played one by one. So there's a, there's a variety of combinations you can use it to handle the maximum concurrent transaction coming from the client. It is totally up to you how you want to secure your upstream. The idea behind the whole rate limiting is all about how can your upstream uh, handle this kind of concurrent uh, transaction? Not all upstreams are all equal, right? Every time, you know, some of the modern uh, uh, microservices we've been developing, that should be fine. But some of the legacy applications, like you know, monolithic applications, can't handle uh, that level of concurrent transactions. So there are, uh, you know, you can do that level of um, uh, policies that can be applied in, in each uh, API level. Not in the server level, you can apply that in the API level to say that I want to actually uh, accept this much of a burst, which is a concurrent transaction. And also, would you like to delay it or no delay? It? There are these are the few parameters goes along with uh, the rate limiting uh, directive. There you go. So my just shared. So if you need more information, then or please feel free to reach out. Uh, this one, I mean, to be honest, uh, this uh, uh, we've been thinking of doing a separate, uh, like a thirty minutes or a one hour session on rate limiting alone uh, to make sure that we have a variety of combinations where you can actually make that to work for your uh, company. There is no right or wrong way. It's about how you can protect your upstream services. The and Nginx Plus gives you amazingly amazing flexibility to uh, apply that uh, to protect your services. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we can do that session on the, uh, so we can keep an, keep an eye on our uh, YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure we will be doing that very, very soon. There has been a much of ask came around on the live stream as well. We'll definitely do a session on that one. Or please feel free to reach out to us if you need uh, you know more uh, in-depth knowledge about that one. Sorry, Mike, you were about to say, yeah, I think we Okay, that's been great questions. Thank you very much. Um, these um yeah just just uh, real quick so format string so user defined format string there you can see there's a lot of variables we can pull out the information for your your log messages so i uh, just wanted to show that uh, what is that max request size and max message size the request sizes you can send a number of uh, requests there 
Yeah, yeah. So in the message section, you where you have your requests, uh, you can limit. So if somebody is you know uploading War and Peace, you don't want that to show up in your uh, in your uh, your. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. I think uh, it's time. Uh, let's wrap it up. I think this is going to be a great one for us because it's the first ever time we are wrapping it in time. So, so uh, let's pat our uh, ourselves on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. Uh, please feel free to reach us uh, on our uh, booth. We will be present there, or feel free, feel free to reach us directly. Uh, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Good. Thanks.